Hi everyone, my name is Kostandinos. I'm a second year PhD student at the Imperial College London. My research area lies in the intersection of machine learning and brain computer interfaces. I'm also working as a machine learning engineer at Cogitat, a BCI startup and winner of NeurIPS 2021 Beatle competition. Today, I will be talking about a causal viewpoint on motor imagery brainwave decoding. But first, I would like to start with a short introduction in machine learning and causality. In the machine learning world, and more specifically in a classification task, we have some input data, here are the pictures of cats and dogs, and our goal is to learn a function that predicts the output label. In this case, whether this uh, is a cat or a dog. In essence, it is a statistical model that tries to estimate the conditional probability p of y given x using an appropriate objective function. Causal reasoning is the analysis of a task in terms of cause and effect relationships between the different variables of interest. In a classification machine learning problem, we want to estimate the condition probability p of y given x. A task can be either causal when x causes y, prediction effect from cause, or anti-causal when y causes x, prediction cause from effect. Back in the BCIs now, for the task of motor imagery brainwave decoding, we have some trials of EG signals, and we want to find the uh, appropriate uh, function f that predicts whether the subject imagines the movement of her hand, uh, right hand, left hand, or feet. For the causal analysis, we can say that the true MI intention observed with the MI label y can be considered the cause of the recorded EG signal x. We can also consider X as a sequence of imperfect observed measurements in sensor space of the true unobserved brain activation Z within mainly the cortinal areas responsible for the sensory motor reads. Therefore, we can define an MIEG classification task as an anti-causal problem where Y causes Z and then, in turn, Z causes X. As a consequence of the above anti-causal definition, and causal diagram, we can explore the problem of MI EG classification through the following factorization. P of Y comma X comma Z equals P of Y times P of Z given Y times P of X given Z. We can also consider X as a sequence of imperfect observed measurements in sensor space of the true unobserved brain activation Z which mainly are the cortinal areas responsible for the sensory motor aid. Therefore, we can define an MIEG classification task as an anti-causal problem, where Y causes Z causes X. As a consequence of the above anti-causal definition and the causal diagram that you see over here, we can explore the problem of MIEG classification through the following factorization, uh, causal factorization. Now, through this causal breakdown, we can categorize the major challenges associated with motor imagery classification tasks into three main categories. So the challenges that uh, are related with the training EG data. Here we have the different acquisition uh, EG recorders, which have different channels or different hardware, and also the data scarcity due to length acquisition processes that the subject needs to be in the lab for hours in order to get enough trials out of it. Second, we have the anatomical differences. As the previous speaker also said, each subject has a unique brain anatomy and functionality that results in polymorphous neural activity patterns when appeared in the observed EEG signal. And finally, we have the class imbalance uh, that can arise between the training and the deployment side. In this work, we focus mainly on the challenge of subject distribution shift or intersubject variability. We can see it here um, as a shift in the probability of Z given Y. So what is the definition of this is exactly that. It's a neurophysiological process that underpins the AG signals that vary across subject, causing a covariance shift across data. So the proposed uh, framework is based on the concept of dynamic convolutions. A dynamic convolution layer is an effective way to increase the model's uh, complexity without increasing the network's depth or width. And since each convolution layer is computed by dynamically mixing multiple parallel length convolutional kernels using an input dependent attention vector. So here, instead of having a BCI architecture that tries to discover uh, a common latent space for all K subjects in a training set, we, we use K parallel uh, convolutional kernels 
corresponding to this uh, training subject for each convolutional block of the CNN um, BCI network. So using a subject attention network that learns to distinguish between developable individuals, we decouple the subject essentially trains simultaneously k parallel personalized models and twin. So what happens during inference? During inference, when an EG signal from a new unseen subject is processed, it first passes through this attention subject attention network and the subject attention vector P is computed. Well, ideally, we would like to use the knowledge from all the case subjects that we have in the training set and shift the attention more to the most relevant subject, the ones that looks closer to the new subject through this attention mechanism. To accomplish that, we compute what we call the uniformly attended vector, A star. So if no attention was used, then we would have K parallel convolutions and we would mix them with the factor one over K. Here we have um, in the, to compute the uniform attended vector, what we do is essentially we combine these one over k factors with the subject attention vector p, and we pass them through a softmax activation in essence to flatten the attention across our subject while maintaining the focus on the most relevant ones. So in other words, here the, uh, using the causal factorization that we used before, uh, what we try to do is essentially uh, to estimate the uh, the probability of z given y from the new subject uh, through a linear combination of the learned conditional probabilities from the subject that we have in the training set. So how all of this is connected to causality? In order to evaluate this framework, we will use a public available motor imagery data set, namely uh, FisherNet, and uh, which has a large number of different subjects, is class balanced, and has a relatively enough trial per subject and is only from one EG recorder. So essentially uh, it solves all the challenges that we identify through causality, but the subject distribution shape. So therefore we know that the framework that we're providing here tackles the specific uh, problem. Our proposed framework uh, demonstrates increased performance when applied to different PCI architectures in two different motor imagery tasks, um, and motor imagery left uh, hand versus uh, right hand, and also left hand, right hand, and feet. For four well-established um, BCI architectures, uh, namely shallow continent, deep continent, EGNet, and EG inception. Although this constitutes a resort in this research direction, we strongly believe that the proposed framework can have further benefits in the MIBCIs, and in future work, we plan to use this framework to tackle uh, more, if not all, of the challenges uh, described in the causal analysis. Primary results that I discussed with today have been published at the ICLR workshop on object structure and causality, and you can check the paper through this QR code. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Konstantinos. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, the, the topic is very relevant to my research area, so I have a couple of questions uh, I'd like to ask. Like first, of first of all, it looks like it looks uh, like transfer learning, but it is different, right? And what what are the main differences? Yes, so in transfer learning, what you have is a training set. So you train in a few subjects, and then when you want to move to some new subject, you take some trials for it as a calibration set and basically you retrain. What we propose here doesn't require any calibration. It's uh, dynamically adapted. So each time a new subject comes, the attention provides an attention score. And basically we use this to combine the learned kernels from the training set. Essentially you say that we have a different number of um, uh, machine learning models. So the main difference here is that it doesn't require any calibration. But you do take some recording for the attention. Uh, we, we use the same recording that we want to classify. So this recording that needs to be classified first goes through the attention, uh, calculates the weights from the dynamic convolution, and then we use these uh, dynamic weights that have been computed to classify the movement. All right. Um, have you tried any other data sets for testing the testing your method? Like because yes, there are many we have motor imager data sets, likely. 
response? Yes, we have been testing on also different data sets. Uh, yeah, and we can say that the framework also is transferable. Yeah, it's linked to one question I had actually in mind because you tested it on multi-metric uh, BCI, but do you think that it can be also used for different kinds of paradigm or for P300, for instance? Uh, yes, we believe that it's used in different BCI parts. Uh, the reason why we did it in motor imagery only is because we had the causal analysis in the beginning. Um, if we wanted to use it in different data sets, we could do, but we would also need to uh, do the causal breakdown for all of these different uh, BCI paradigms and then be sure that uh, the framework tackles this specific challenge. Uh, I will assure you that that's something we're looking uh, forward. <laughs> No, but it's really important for you and even to prove that your uh, pipeline and your approach is actually robust enough to be used to any kind of BCA and it's that just uh, like another argument to, to add in your favor. So I think it's really interesting and what I'm actually uh, enjoying that you tried different kind of data, data sets uh, because it's, I wouldn't say it's easy, but you can try with one and because you're lucky it can work, but uh, in different kinds of data sets, even because you had have perhaps a different kind of um, noise level, for instance, or different voltages that are uh, used, you could have different uh, performance in the end. So I really appreciate this kind of uh, analysis. Um, so I didn't mention that <laughs> just to, because it's, it's important to, to try to uh, make your approach robust enough to be applied to any kind of data sets. Yes, so we have tried, as I said, to different data sets. And also, as I've shown, we didn't do only one task, but we went from binary classification to three class yeah. problem. And yeah, we I know this problem. <laughs> yes. I can imagine because uh, instead of just, uh, not just, but classify two tasks and then to four or more, it's a different challenge. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Konstantinos. Uh, our next speaker is Gerrit Fedin. He is from Southern California, University of Southern California, and he will be talking about developing brain computer interfaces with everyone. Stage is yours. Awesome. Yeah, thank you all for having me. It's really great to be here and hear everybody else's work. So yeah, my talk is on developing brain computer interfaces with everyone. Uh, my name is Garrett. I'm a graduating or graduated at this point. It's very exciting. Uh, graduated master's student uh, in media arts, games, and health at the University of Southern California. Uh, and I have a background in computational neuroscience. So I'm sure we're already all aware of this, but you know, what are brain computer interfaces? They're uh, devices that measure neural activity and convert this into control and communication signals for healthy individuals, as well as currently largely people with disabilities. A very common paradigm within brain computer interfaces is P300. So this is a positive deflection of the voltage uh, at 300 milliseconds after stimulus presentation. And this is usually evoked by some uh, surprise stimuli. So you can evoke this very reliably with uh, flashing rows and columns on a grid, and then use that to select an individual letter for people who have communication difficulties uh, in order to spell and communicate with other people. This paradigm has also been used in more interdisciplinary approaches. So this is some work from Andrea Kubler's group uh, with brain painting, where they allowed people with ALS to create art with uh, P300. One Notable fact about P300 devices and hardware and systems, however, is that between 1988 and 2017, only 3% of P300 BCI studies addressed how to provide end users with sustainable access to the technology. And so this indicates that currently there are not a lot of measures being taken in order to distribute applications to the people that need them after their time in our research facility. And we foresee this as sort of a general problem within BCIs where it's difficult to actually get systems out to the people that we are promising that need the technology. So this is largely due to some of the existing software infrastructure within BCIs. Um, so you can think of BCI 2000, OpenVibe and other systems. In general, 
there are a lot of difficulties with distributing these applications. So you have to download some of the binaries or a compiled version that's compatible with only macro windows. Um, and once you open the application, it's got a pretty complicated user interface. Again, this sort of leans towards higher barriers to entry for people who have non-technical backgrounds who may not be up to speed with the latest, greatest in DCIs. This includes students, artists, and people with disabilities themselves. Uh, they have tight interde interdependencies with hardware um, and largely core developers contribute to these systems. So there's not a lot of flexibility for outside contributors to jump in and, and help with sort of the core as well as even really some of the periphery of the software ecosystems. So a core research question then is how can we bring um, PCI research from the lab into the home, bring these systems from places where you, know, you have to have experts to set it up to places where you can have somebody autonomously engaging with these systems uh, from the comfort of their own homes, which again is largely where people with disabilities stay. In this research, we explored a uh, paradigm called research engagement always and with everyone, uh, which has a couple of core principles. Um, so this includes non-technical engagement with uh, people who may be in, interested in BCI system development. So this includes people with disabilities, students, artists, and the general public. Uh, simplified research infrastructure where we're sort of stepping away from a lot of the complicated architectures of production systems, um, strong partnerships with research groups and people with uh, particular disabilities and particular focuses on certain disabilities. Uh, and then finally, open prototyping. So first we'll introduce non-technical engagement. So this is engaging people without technical knowledge about brain computer interfaces with the actual um, ideas around engaging with these systems. So this can include things like workshops where you're developing ideas around what future BCI systems might look like, what people need, um, and how to develop those effectively for people's use at home. Um, so for us and our group, we created this event called Brains and Games International Design Fiction Competition. So this invited people from around the world to develop their idea for a brain controlled game uh, and submit it to us. Um, we ended up getting uh, 20 submissions from around the world. Largely this was from students under the age of 18. So we had a lot of minors participating and seemed to be very deeply engaged um, largely due to some support from their teachers. Uh, we actually had 48 judges uh, across neuroscience, interactive media, and uh, neuroethics participating with us and uh, actively looking at all of these submissions. And we ended up distinguishing 12 winning teams and giving them uh, open BCI and use headbands. And so what we wanted to do was engage a lot of these younger people with systems of brain computer interfaces in a way that didn't necessarily require technical developments, but could lead to that development. We provided some technical support for them as they wanted to continue building some systems. Uh, the second principle is simplified research infrastructure. So this is developing technologies with systems that don't have all of these complicated interdependencies. Uh, we approached this problem with an event called Livewire, stimulating native neurotechnology. This was funded by the USC Arts and Humanities Initiative, and it engaged people from around the world with the ethical implications of brain technologies. Uh, we included four talks, three at the beginning from Dong Song at the Center for Neural Engineering at USC, uh, Aaron Klein from the Center for Neurotechnology at the University of Washington, and Judy Ellis from Neurethics Canada. And during the middle of this, we had a Discord discussion. So this was all online uh, during the pandemic. We had 500 RSVPs, 200 attendees, and uh, 47 people who signed up as research subjects who we could follow up with after the event and do some qualitative research with. And finally, after all of this uh, broader discussion, we had Joe Artuso from OpenBCI give a closing talk on sort of the future of commercial neurotechnology. We also shared a web-based prototype of a BCI system. So this was called Brainstorm. It allowed anybody from around the world to sign in to a website and connect a Muse or OpenBCI headset. And it would compare synchrony across these individuals uh, from wherever they were. It would just stream that data um, between different instances uh, on the web. As I said, we engaged a lot of people through Discord. This was an active asynchronous discussion throughout the entirety of the event. And we followed up with a lot of them 
um, as research subjects and conducted qualitative interviews to get their further perspective on the event itself, as well as the future of the ethics of neurotechnology. And the third principle is strong partnerships. And so our approach for this really is partnering with um, the BCI for Kids program at the University of Calgary. So they develop brain controlled games for kids with cerebral palsy. Uh, and we helped to produce the BCI Game Jam 2021 Multiplayer Madness, uh, where we helped to produce multiplayer games for these kids and outfit uh, the hackathon participants with the capacities to actually develop multiplayer games. And finally, open prototyping is something that is really near and dear to my heart. It's the development of technologies openly on, say, GitHub and other code sharing platforms so that your work is always inspectable and always able to be run uh, by people who have some peripheral involvement with the uh, activities of your research. So this involves a lot of prototyping systems that you can just simply distribute to anybody who wants to try to use them that doesn't require uh, a lot of setup time. And, and it's really fun for a lot of uh, sharing so that you can get feedback very rapidly and iterate. Um, so one final point I'd like to talk about is developing and distributing brain computer interfaces on the open web. This is the approach that our group has taken to actually follow up with the research engagement always and with everyone approach. Um, and this has a, a lot of backing with some key benefits. So really, when you develop technologies on the open web, there are zero dependencies or ideally zero dependencies. So you simply open a web page, press some buttons, and you can use the application as you wish. There's, there's no external software that you have to download in order to use the system. This allows for simplified distribution. So again, you don't have to download anything. Additionally, you just send somebody a link and they open the page uh, and engage with your system. You can introduce systems for continuous data collection. So if somebody streams um, EEG data into the system, you can stream that to a server, put it in a database. And all of this is optional, of course. Uh, and finally, because it's on the open web, there is the opportunity for community contributions. And there's the largest number of uh, developers in the world is developing a JavaScript, which is the core technology behind the web. So some examples of this approach include a system called EEG EDU. Uh, and what it allows you to do is use and use headbands to uh, learn about uh, brain computer interfaces and electrophysiology in general. Um, so you simply log onto the web page, um, press a button to connect to your Muse device, and you can see raw data, you can see the frequency um, components on a spectrogram, you could control interactive applications. Uh, and overall, it's a really fun and engaging system used for educational purposes. Um, another educational platform that was developed is Neuroflow, and this was by Chris Crawford's group at the University of Alabama. And this allows high school students to develop neurofeedback applications using a block-based and flow-based programming system. And they found that this actually increased student self-efficacy in addition to teaching them, obviously, the components of a brain-computer interface system in a really easy to use way. And finally, I'd just like to highlight what this system looks like in practice. And so we've developed some technology uh, it's on app.brainsofplay.com if you ever wanna check it out. Um, but what I can do is I have a Muse headband here. Um, I, all I have to do is turn it on, um, go into the device manager and find our device. So we have a lot of support for other BCI systems or, or EEG systems. So this includes OpenBCI, um, emotive, Neurosity, and even BCI 2000 using a plugin called BCI 2000 Web. Um, so we do integrate with sort of the existing standards of brain computer interface development. So if I press connect on the Muse, it asks me to pair, and all I have to do is press pair. It will tell me when I'm connected, and I can go into any of these applications, and they will be impacted by the real-time data on this headset. Uh, I'm not putting it on just for the sake of time, but so here are the four channels. Here is real-time FFTs on the GPU. Um, and we can look at any of the four channels. And this is coherence between all of these channels and mapped to a 3D blob that you can play and poke around with. Uh, one notable component of this system is that you can use it to control. So we have this Pong game. Right now I can control it with the arrow keys, but if I had this on and I was blinking, um, I could similarly move this paddle up and down. We also have this visual editor built in. So uh, as I move the paddle up and down, you can see that a signal is being transmitted between these two event nodes over to um, a movement node, and finally over to the user interface where you can see that you move the paddle and it, and it hits the ball. 
so these are all just, again, very open, rapid prototypes of a system that can integrate EEG data from a lot of different devices and use it to control applications all natively on a web browser. This does not include any streaming capabilities outside of the web, uh, or at least not natively. So we're not actually sending data anywhere except within your local browser. So it's all sec it's secure as your browser is. Um, and uh, I will leave the demonstration at that. I do have a couple more slides. So uh, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, all of the people that I've worked with over the last couple of years. This uh, includes Josh Brewster, who's uh, a founding partner of Brains of Play, an organization that we've developed around this technology. Uh, Marantina Gutsis and Dong Song, who are both uh, founders of the Brains at Play initiative, which sort of kicked off all of these uh, entertainment events and, and our funders and the rest of our growing community. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you all for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Garrett. It was great. Actually, I was going to ask if there is a platform that we can use, uh, like a drag and drop kind of design to uh, code some BCIs, and you just show that. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. And like for like, and I saw there are a couple of devices we can choose, right? And how does the signal processing works? Are they use their own signal processing platforms or? Right. right. So the common software you used for all. Right. So most of the devices that we use communicate over either Bluetooth or USB. Um, so the web has new APIs for directly acquiring signals using those networking protocols. And so we're simply getting those packets and putting them within the same data structure so that we can process them uniformly. Um, there's some considerations for web sockets. So that's what BCI 2000 web uses. Um, and that obviously is something where you have BCI 2000 doing a majority of the work and simply sending you commands uh, that it determines are interesting. Uh, and the final note is systems like Neurosity have the capacity to stream over Wi-Fi and um, from their servers. So that's another, it's sort of a layered system around WebSockets and it's streaming from a remote server. So you actually wear the headset, it sends to their server and sends back to you. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but ultimately what's happening is we're putting the data into a uniform data structure and then processing it that way. We can add filters arbitrarily, but we've tried to keep a lot of the data pretty clean. Um, so just to the point for a Muse headband, it's very noisy until you actually apply a filter. So we just do that automatically for at least the users of our platform so that they don't have to deal with, with a lot of the complexities of signal filtering. But it's all inspectable and, and capable of being moved around as the user wishes. Yeah, and also it is very limited area in the Muse that you can get the EG. There's oh, only yeah. a front area, right? Uh, there's behind the ears too, but it's TP9 and TP10. Uh, but it's, I wouldn't necessarily consider that to be high quality EG signal. Yeah, they, they are just mainly using it for meditation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I also got that nurse to crown device. Mm -hmm. I have one and it's it is interesting what the like what you do is just taking some data and converting to a uniform shape so you can process all in your software right that's what i understand from your point yeah and and we've actually started abstracting a lot of different web libraries so that this is really all dependent upon putting your application within our entire framework from data acquisition all the way down to the application development um, over the last six months, we've developed systems for each bit. So you can only you only need to use the data acquisition API that we use, and then it organizes it in a uniform way. Um, we have some networking systems, we have some data processing and, and user interface development systems, but all of them are now completely decoupled. So you can pick and choose whichever one you'd want to use and, and overall simplify the development of your system. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience or uh, the other speakers? I don't want to spend all five minutes with uh, just by myself, like asking questions. No, we're on time. It's perfect. Perfect. <laughs> on time, I think. Yeah, if anyone's <laughs> interested, it's all, it's all open on GitHub at uh, Brains at Play. 
um, as an organization. Could you um, add perhaps uh, in the chat box uh, yeah. the link you mentioned your presentation can be worthwhile? Perfect. Yeah, I'll show the app and the GitHub. Perfect. Thank you very much. I think we can now at least switch to the um, general discussion. So here, um, the aim of this part is just to enable further discussion on the presentation, but also to provide some feedbacks to the speakers. Um, so to make this part more dynamic, do not hesitate to raise your hand. I know that there are plenty of people <laughs> in the audience, <laughs> but uh, the point is just to enable discussions and to provide like more interactive uh, feedbacks to the different speakers. So as we, at the moment, we prepared the, this event, uh, we had a great the conversations on different topics. Uh, in particular, uh, we had in mind to discuss about uh, ways to collect and to share the sets. Uh, because as we mentioned in the beginning of the event, uh, in particular, Nibras uh, did a great job uh, in collecting data and make it uh, publicly available. We saw also with uh, Konstantinos, it was important to test the data sets in different kinds of data, uh, I mean, test approaches, sorry, in different kinds of data sets. So data sharing is a very important in our field, especially in BCI, uh, to make our uh, approach as most reproducible and replicable as possible to be able to test, be tested online with uh, end users. So perhaps just to start the discussion, we can ask uh, Nibra to give us some inputs about uh, his experience in um, data sharing and uh, at the moment when he tried to public, uh, publicate his work, for instance, if you want. I was still here, Nibras. <laughs> you muted if it's uh, perhaps a main problem. Maybe Garrett can start because it is also. Yeah, also, also exactly. Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, just to have some perhaps thoughts about data sharing, uh, how can oh, sure. we do that? Perhaps also shed some guidelines on ways to share data because it's also a problem when you have uh, several data sets to have the common format, for instance, even from right. the more logistical point of view, for instance. Yeah, so I come from sort of a peripheral side of brain computer interface. Basis. So I'm not 100% familiar with the absolute standard, if there even is one within BCI. No, there is no, that's a problem, <laughs> actually. So uh, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. So, you know, my recommendations are, there are two standards. One of them is um, neurodata without borders, and the other one is the brain imaging data structure. And they have a lot of support for EG um, and other imaging modalities. Um, they have the capacity to basically describe an entire experiment. And they're supported by um, the NIH, uh, at least in the United States, the NIH uh, Dandy Archive. So this is the Brain Initiatives um, Data Standard Archive. And so if you can create a data system or a, a data set that actually is formatted in this way, it, it's able to be interoperable with a lot of other tools that are developed by researchers um, currently. And so th those would be the two that I would point you to just to check out. Um, I'm actually also working on tools to parse that data in a web browser and then automatically um, modify it. So it, it's a lot of really exciting stuff. And I think that it, it's going to be um, really useful for the future of neuroscience to actually have data in ways that you don't have to parse it yourself and make it all the same. Thank you very much. Or something else, do you have any thought or wishes? If you, you can make a wish list in your case. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I know the, how hard it is to have uh, EG data sets. I mean, as I said, it takes uh, a lot of time to collect data. Uh, what I think it's important for the BCI community is to have some uh, rules uh, like how we pre-process data. Uh, for example, we have all these uh, time series and different data sets cut different trials, uh, which include ERPs or not include ERPs. So we need mm -hmm. to have some common structure there and we'll be able as a community to evaluate our uh, algorithm methods, you know, more uniformly. And I think that's uh, what's missing. And as I said, again, uh, we have a 
abundance of uh, EG recorders. Uh, so every single data set has a different hardware behind it. Uh, so we have different filtering and all of these yeah, are issues that we need to tackle, especially it's a very hard problem in our community to combine data set together. And I think it's a very, very important challenge that we need to tackle at some point. <laughs> yeah, and actually, it's a very fair point. And uh, just a link to this uh, element. I would like to share with you uh, a link. Uh, it's Mobebi, perhaps you know it. Uh, it's like initiative to promote benchmarking uh, in the BCI domain. And the point is that uh, give access um, to different data sets, of course, but also on ways to, um, let's say, evaluate the classification performance and ways on how to compare different approaches uh, uh, with different data sets in such way that you can, for instance, for instance uh, perform some meta-analysis over different data sets and compare very uh, carefully your different pipelines, for instance. So I think it's also a nice resources, especially for trainees uh, to start with, and they did a great job in uh, proposing some tutorials, for instance, for the newcomers in the BCI and machine learning domain. Uh, and they also use um, like Python-based um, algorithms and the codes, and so we linked with MNE Python, for instance, and also um, Scikit-learn, so the most uh, used perhaps uh, tools in our domain. So maybe just like a propaganda for Mobi. <laughs> I'm not paid by them. I need to mention that, but <laughs> it is also very hard to. Uh like conduct the experiment in a standard way with the same mm -hmm. devices because every, every technician has a different understanding in the EG data when, right. when they check if the signal is all right or not. You're right because in, even from more uh, like experimental point of view, um, it's like more common knowledge, let's say, for instance, uh, very simple things such as uh, the impedance level when you're performing an EG experiment, uh, what can be your threshold for some laboratories? It can be like 20 kilo ohm. For other, it can be different. Uh, there are very slight differences, but in the end, it can have huge um, consequences on your signal processing and the, on the quality of your data set. So having like guidelines or recommendations can be super useful for everybody. Yeah, another interesting organization to check out is actually INCF. So they're a standards organization, just generally within neuroscience. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how much power or influence that they have over BCIs and how much of a voice that they have, but it might be interesting if you know we develop enough of a critical mass within the field itself to start involving some of these uh, external standards organizations as well. Uh, to my knowledge, I only have in mind like the bits format, but it's more about data storage. How can we? Uh, say set all that that set for instance different different folders depending if it's eeg or magnetoencephalography data or mri for instance it's more about how to store and uh, classify the data your information nothing more but from more like the experimental part uh, right. i don't have in mind uh, specific guidelines perhaps more general one but the eeg and meg but again, as Fatih mentioned before, it strongly depends on your materials and uh, and your scientific questions as usual. Because even for the signal processing part, uh, depending on your scientific question, you will need to perform um, like filtering, for instance, or ICAs or any kind of um, algorithm. But it strongly depends on your scientific question. Because, for instance, if you're interested in the uh, higher frequency bands um, or not, uh, you're not going to perform the same uh, pipeline as another person, for instance. But thank you very much for sharing all the thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think go ahead. The, the one advantage is like it allows for creativity for everyone to come up with different type of experiments or uh, you know devices with like this. So it is in in a one way, it is uh, hard to standardize the process, but it mm -hmm. also allows to develop new approach to tackle the same problems. Actually, providing guidelines would also help in uh, ensuring some reproducibility in our analysis and your experiments, also, because uh, even some 
let's say, what can be considered as details, for instance, the instructions you're giving to the subject can have a huge influence on the success or not of your experiment. So also this kind of information should be uh, reported in the paper, for, for instance, or even in guidelines. Yeah, that's, that's true. It's like now what to do this now. <laughs> okay, um, then we have, again, five minutes. Perhaps, well, we have like a very large question <laughs> with Fati. We can, we can ask our speakers about that if you want. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. just, uh... I don't want to be responsible of that. Okay, but that's fine. <laughs> no, uh, that is just a um, very quick question, but hard to, to answer in my opinion, about the BCI literacy. Perhaps in your own specific domains, uh, how can you address uh, the BCI deficiency? Perhaps for the audience or people who are going to watch uh, the event afterwards, we can just remind the different the definition of a BCI literacy, that is that for about 20 to 30% of the users, it is not possible to control the BCI even after several training sessions, which is due to the huge problem, especially for end users, such as like a definition part. So now I would like to ask uh, the speakers to, you know, to, to, to let us know uh, how they can handle or trying to address uh, this issue. wants to start <laughs> uh i can start <laughs> if you want thank you <laughs> uh so yeah it's a common problem in uh, bci's intersubject variability and intercession variability so it doesn't matter if we have a lot of sessions from the same subject uh mm -hmm. when you wear the device when you're an end user your i don't know mental um activity or whatever it might interact with how you you interact with the bci system so that's something that's a very like question that we try to answer in my group um, and uh, as i said uh, in the talk this kind of dynamic approaches i think it's uh, i think it's the way forward uh, for at least uh, for all these different questions so we uh, demonstrated some results now with intersubject variability but uh, we would also like to answer the question of intercession, et cetera, using this kind of uh, attention dynamic approaches, um, which I think is a, 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 a way forward because as I said, doesn't need, require any calibration. So it's dynamic, it's on the fly. We don't need to uh, get more data, retrain the model and come back to that. And other techniques could be also um, if you uh, somehow align different uh, your data. So. But still, in these cases, like we have seen it a few years back in the BCI alignment techniques, but uh, we, when we tried it in real life application, didn't really work very well. Uh, but yeah, it's also uh, another another possibility here. You're right. It's a very fair point because uh, you can conceive a very fancy approach, but then you need to to test it online, uh, which is, in my opinion, like the real validation of your approach and uh, especially for instance for adapt adaptive adaptive sorry um pacifiers it's really very hard to find a trade-off uh in trying to um reparameterize your your pacifier and then to provide the feedback fast enough to the subject to to remain like super um motivated in performing the experiment Garrett, do you have any? Yes, thoughts? exactly. We, we have seen uh, okay. approaches from. Yeah, sorry. No, no, please go ahead. No, 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 we have seen uh, up, <laughs> Yeah, we have seen from Riemannian approaches, for example, uh, Riemannian alignments. Uh, but then when we tried real life application, it didn't work out. So I think that they are deep learning plus uh, different other techniques, uh, other alignments or uh, dynamic approaches can give us uh, a nice framework. Thank you. Go oh, ahead, so, 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 so super interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting that Konstantina sort of operationalized what BCI literacy and illiteracy means, because um, I think that that term is commonly used with, within the field just as a way to point towards this general problem of certain people not being able to use BCIs. But I think 
once you actually get down to the technical definition, what it is is that the BCI can't recognize the person's exactly. brain activity that corresponds to a certain signal. So I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of critiques of the term itself as, as sort of a way that stigmatizes certain users. And I think that's very detrimental to the field itself. And I, again, I think it's really interesting that once you operationalize what it means that you know the signal actually gets changed when there are different states of the person's brain, whether attentional or otherwise. And that points towards a problem and, and by definition, there are also a solution um, where BCI literacy and illiteracy simply just says, oh, well, certain people can or can't use the system and, and they're either just gonna have to deal with it or we have to change the person and not the way that we actually design our systems. So just wanted to point out that I think it's really interesting um, to define what that means and then start to, to make steps towards, you know, actually saying what we can do. Um, I don't have personal opinions or ideas around <laughs> what we can do, but it's, but it's great that other people do. <laughs> no, no, but the, you're right. And I just mentioned one, one paper from uh, Thompson about actually the way we are dealing with the BCI literacy. And it's actually in line with what you mentioned just uh, before, because uh, in the beginning, the, um, let's say, the underlying idea was, okay, it's because of the subject. It's not that easy. Uh, because it's a process that actually um, involved two, um, two learners. So the, the subject, of course, but also the machine. So it's not that easy. And uh, it's important to mention that. And even in our ways to try and, let's say, to address this issue, we should actually adopt the two perspectives, both the machines and the subject. So in the end, I don't think that there is just one answer to be too easy, of course. But <laughs> yeah, uh, but trying to adopt different kind of uh, perspective can be useful for, for this kind of issue. Nibas, also, I, as, yeah. as an addition, uh, like yes. uh, one of the EEG company owners, Christopher Gruber, once there was a summer school, he said, like, there's no BCI literacy from our perspective. We don't have the technology yet. So we need to find a ways to decode the subjects that we couldn't right now. And yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, it's hard it's hard to know whether the uh, the, the process we develop is not working or not, or the subject is just not giving his full motivation. So mm -hmm. there's see, also a point to yeah point to attract the subjects uh, attention to the experiment because the, the generally the experiment paradigms are very boring like no, personally not ours no. <laughs> <laughs> no but you're right i mean super repetitive uh sometimes oh, because as actually mentioned for something else before because you need to perform some training part uh, without providing feedback uh it can cause some tiredness and uh, uh, in the end the subject can lack of uh, motivation because uh, he or she is repeating many, many times the same task without any feedback. So in then it can be quite, uh, can generate some tiredness. Yeah, exactly, because I tried the motor imagery myself and it is very hard to uh, stay in the focus. Yeah, that's the key. So pro tips, be focused on your task all time long. <laughs> I don't know if you're still here or not. I know if, you can share with us some uh, thoughts? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. So do you want to, to share some thoughts about this uh, beside efficiency uh, issue? And you uh, can for coming. Sorry, but uh, uh, yes, uh, there is a really in the efficiency part, it's not really uh, stable uh, what we have achieved so far. In sake of biometrics, we should take into account also uh, some issues related to cybersecurity and for privacy. Uh, for example, we should take for false acceptance rate and false acceptance rate, uh, which means when a person wants to authenticate himself, will the system fail or not? This is similar to when you try to open your phone, but you cannot. On the other hand, when another person wants to steal the identity. So we need to find like a compromise between those two points. We don't want to be the system very secure or we want it to be user friendly. So it's really 
not so easy to have a good comparison here, com comprehension. I guess it. And yes, I, I can imagine your point. Actually, you're right. Um, is there any comments or thought from the audience? I'm trying, just in case. <laughs> Okay, so if not, I think we can thank again your speakers, our speakers uh, today because they did a great job. Um, and to conclude this session, I would, we would like, with Fatih, um, to warmly thank the members of the postdocs and the students committee who have us in the organization of the event with Vivek and Sandrine. Uh, finally, we'd like to thank the board uh, of the BSA Society that gave us the opportunity to propose this kind of event. Um, and dedicated session for the trainees. So feel free to contact us if you have any questions or remarks or uh, thought about how to improve um, this kind of event, um, because we're really um, willing to know your opinion on, uh, on this initiative. And so I think it's time to write up. So thank you all and see you in November for the third session, hopefully, uh, of the new session of the Trainee Spotlight. Thank you very much and bye. Thank you, Nebraska. Thank you, Constantine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.